He did not stop creating. He did not stop being the creator. If you need a creative miracle, he's the creator. The narrow road is the more difficult road. But the narrow road is the one that leads to eternal life. Well, I'm going to continue on with a series that I started um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Debbie, uh, Sister Debbie preached last Sunday. She had a good word for us about revival and flowing in the river. And I've been talking about God's grace, mercy, and judgment. How many of you know that God is perfectly balanced and perfect in everything that he does? When he extends grace, when he extends mercy, and even when he extends judgment. He is perfect in every way. Um, I do want to remind you that today is Communion Sunday. And if you haven't picked up your communion elements, they're on the tables. And uh, you can pick one up. They're the individually wrapped. We'll receive those towards the end. So if you didn't get one, just feel free to go and pick one up whenever you want. We're not, we're not passing them out just for, um, you know, safety reasons. And, uh, but you're welcome to go and pick one up. Um, d- grace is divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or rebirth and sanctification. It's a virtue that comes from God. It's a state of sanctification enjoyed through divine favor. Grace is the unmerited love and favor of God towards human beings. Divine influence acting in a person to make the person pure. It's God's grace that flows through us that transforms us and makes us pure and holy and righteous in his sight. It's his grace. It's what makes us morally strong. It's the condition of a person brought to God's favor through this influence, a special virtue, a gift, or help given to God by a person. God's grace and God's mercy are often confused because sometimes we use the words interchangeably, but they're not exactly the same. Although they are similar expressions of his favor and love, they possess clear distinctions. When we experience God's grace, we receive favor that we did not deserve. How many of you have received favor that you know you did not deserve? I can raise both hands. <laughs> we all have received that. If you are saved today, you received grace you did not deserve. If Jesus is your savior, you have received the grace that you did not deserve. None of us deserved it. But thank God it's not by works of righteousness. Amen. <clears throat> when we experience God's mercy, we are spared punishment that we deserve. So grace is God's unmerited favor that is given to us when we don't deserve it. And God's mercy is when we are spared from judgment. Mercy is compassion and forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. It implies compassion that forbears punishing even when justice demands it. God's mercy is given to us many times even when God's justice demands it, demands judgment. Mercy means leniency. It means clemency. God has given each one of us clemency. When we deserved the death, the death penalty, he saved us. Mercy means compassion and forgiveness. It even means sympathy and generosity. I love in the Psalms, I believe it's Psalm 103, where it talks about us, that God knows that we're human and that we're flesh and that we have weaknesses. And that is his, his mercy is towards us, his love and his compassion is for us. I'm going to give you some examples today through God's word of where he uh, demonstrated great mercy towards people who definitely deserved judgment. But he withheld judgment and he extended mercy to them. And you see how it changed their life forever. 
I don't know about you, but I know that God extended mercy to me when I deserved punishment, and it changed my life forever. Amen. In Matthew 26, we have the story of where Peter denies Jesus. Peter was one of the most adamant followers of Jesus Christ. And Jesus warned him. He said that Satan wants to sift you, but I've prayed for you. And you know, when Jesus was washing feet, Peter was like, oh, no, no, no. You're not going to wash my feet. Let me, let me wash your feet. <laughs> and Jesus said, well, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you're not part of me. You're not mine. And he goes, well, then just wash me from head to toe then. He kind of missed the point. He was the one that ran straight into the tomb, past everybody first. He was an adamant, ardent follower of Jesus Christ. And he told Jesus, I'll follow you to the death. I'm there for you, Jesus. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm not going to turn my back for you. I'm ready to die for you. How many of us have been so strong in our faith at times that we've said the very same thing? I'm willing to lay down my life for you, Jesus. And then hard times come and we're right out the back door. We think, well, I didn't know it was going to be that hard. But that's what happened to Peter. Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him and said, you are also one of Jesus of Galilee's. Now remember, Jesus had been arrested and he was brought before the court. And Peter was observing from the outside. But he denied it before all of them saying, I do not know what you're saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied it even with an oath, saying, I promise, I don't even know the man. An oath. He swore by it. That's what an oath is. I swear I don't even know the man. That's twice. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. But he began to curse and to swear and to say, I do not know the man. He even threw in a few cuss words to show that he wasn't that Christian. He really had quite a fall, didn't he? He really came far from the guy who said, I'll die for you. I'm willing to stand right by your side. We don't know sometimes what we will do when the pressure is really strong. When the pressure is really bad, Peter was 100% gun ho and then this happened. Immediately a rooster crowed and Peter remembered the word of Jesus and had the words that Jesus had said to him. Before the rooster crows, I will, you will deny me three times. And so he went out and he wept bitterly. He was bitter. He was mad, I think, at himself. When Jesus had even warned him. And when the time and the pressure came, he couldn't do it. He couldn't stand up. And he betrayed Jesus just like he said. And then the rooster crowed. He's like, I know. I know it's what Jesus said. I know what's happened. But look what Jesus does. Jesus did not leave him in that state. When we fall, when we go all the way to the bottom, God will not leave us there. But he will look for us. He will search us he, for us. He will draw us in. He will reel us back by his goodness, his kindness, his grace, and his mercy. In John 21, we see how Jesus sought out Peter, even after Peter's, Peter's greatest failure. So when he had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? You know, what an interesting question that he would ask Peter. Do you love me more than all of these people? 
And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to me, uh, said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to me, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Those were the very first words that Jesus said to Peter when he was walking by the shore of the sea and he called out to Simon Peter and he said, follow me. And Peter, we know that Peter followed him. And then we know that he denied him three times even after he swore he would never deny him. He denied him even with an oath. But then Jesus comes back and restores him and gives him every opportunity to be restored just like he denied him three times. He gave him the opportunity to assure his love for him, his dedication and devotion to him three times. And then he took Peter right back to the beginning and he said, follow me. He reinstated that initial call that he gave Peter. Follow me. I don't know where you're at today. You may have fallen like Peter. You may have made some really big blunders. But Jesus is here today to extend his mercy and to say to you once again, follow me. Follow me. We know Paul, before he was called Paul, was called Saul. And we know that Saul persecuted the church greatly. He had permission, even letters in hand, to imprison and to punish and even put to death those who were in the way, which was Christianity. Acts chapter 9, it says, Then Saul, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found any who were in the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Saul thought that he was doing God a favor. He was on a crusade to put an end to this crazy new Religion, Christianity. He was a Jew through and through. He had never heard of such a thing. He thought he was doing good. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus literally appeared right before Saul when he's on his way to persecute the Christians. And he said, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And then he said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then he said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And then men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice and seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. And we know that eventually he received his sight. He was saved. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. His life totally and completely turned around. But look what Paul says even about himself. 
In 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16, it says, I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Paul is saying, I can't believe that God would choose me, one who was actually persecuting the Christians. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He thought what he was doing was for God. He didn't know he was kicking against God. Look at verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am a chief. He recognized that he was the chief of sinners, but God called him even on his way to persecute the church. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. He chose Paul and pulled him out of darkness into the kingdom of light. Light literally dawned on him. He had a revelation of who Jesus Christ was. And he said that he was a chief of sinners and pulled him out of that life as an example of God's long suffering, as a pattern to those who are going to believe. That's us. If God could choose someone like Paul, he said even of himself that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. That means he was, he was very religious and legalistic by the law. If God could use someone like that, an insolent man, he said, could he not use us? Could he not choose us? And David, what an amazing example of God's mercy in someone's life. We know the story of David. The Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart, that he even had a perfect heart. You say, how could that even be possible in the things that he did, the mistakes that he made? Because he was always quick to repent. We know the story of David. We know that he got involved with another man's wife named Bathsheba. We know that to cover up his sin, he had Bathsheba's husband Uriah put in the front of the battle where the battle was hot so that he would get killed. And then when that did happen, he took her, the widow, Bathsheba, into his home and she became one of his wives. And this thing that he did, it really displeased the Lord. It was something that definitely deserved punishment and judgment. But we see in the story that God ended up having mercy on him. In 2 Samuel 12, verse, starting with verse 1, we see when Nathan the prophet comes and talks to David. He calls David on the carpet for his sin. Many times God will send somebody to us when we've messed up and they'll call us on the carpet for what we've done. We need to listen and we need to repent. That's what David did. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David and he came to him and he said to him, there were two men in one city, one rich man and the other was poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and he nourished it. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate, it, it ate its food and drank its water from his own cup and lay in his bosom. He loved this little lamb. And it was like a daughter to him. 
And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock, from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's little lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Now, when David heard this story at first, he didn't recognize that he was the man. It infuriated him. The injustice of what had happened made him so angry. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb. And because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. And thus the Lord God of Israel says, now here comes the boom. Nathan came to call him on the carpet to lower the boom on him. And he stood there and he took it and he listened to what he had to say. And God said to David, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives in your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if it had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do this evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you have taken his wife to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the people of Amnon. And therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor." And they shall lie with your wives in, this, in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but the thing I will do before Israel is before the sun. So David said to Nathan, immediately he said, I have sinned against the Lord. Immediately his heart was repentful. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. David deserved death. He deserved death by the law. He deserved death. But God had mercy. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child who was born to you shall surely die. And Nathan departed from his house. Many times, because of the decisions that we make, things are set in motion. There is a price to pay for the things that we do. It's, the call, it's the, called the law of sowing and reaping. Even though he had to pay a price for the sin that he committed, God still even in judgment, even in the consequences of his actions, God had mercy on him and didn't kill him. God could have killed him right there on the spot. And he didn't. But he said a curse out through his family lineage because of the sin that he committed. The sword never departed from his house. Many of his house turned against him and against each other. I want to read you the psalm that David wrote when the prophet came and confronted him about his sin. He repented. And he wrote this psalm, this prayer unto God. And he said in Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgression and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Because you, you only have I sinned, excuse me, against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Isn't he? He's just and he's blameless. 
Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and the sin of my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in my inward parts and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. My tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you did not desire sacrifice or I would give it. You did not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. These, God, you will not despise. Do good in your pleasure in Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole offering. They shall offer bulls on your altar. So David repented in his heart before the Lord and God had mercy upon him. Jesus showed mercy to a lot of people. You know, the Pharisees were always trying to catch Jesus in some kind of a misstep or sin or trying to transgress the law in some way. But of course, he never did. But they found this woman. They said they, they caught her in the, the very act of adultery and they came and they drug her and they threw her right in the middle, right in front of Jesus. And we know what they wanted. They wanted Jesus to condemn her. They wanted Jesus to stone her. But Jesus wouldn't do it. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned. But what do you say? And they said, testing him that they might find something to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when he continued asking him, he raised him up and he said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. And then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. When actions desired or actions required punishment and judgment, Jesus was willing to extend mercy. Maybe we were like David. Maybe we've been like Peter and denied him. Maybe we were like the woman who was thrown there in front of Jesus, exposed. We can identify with each one of these stories because we're all shot through with many flaws and imperfections. But God had mercy on us. God extended mercy to each of us by giving his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. It says in Romans 5, 6 through 11, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will die, will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even die, dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
in our ugliness, in our sin, with all of our imperfections and flaws, he still died for us. His blood still flows for us. His forgiveness is still extended to us. Verse nine, much more then, having been justified by the blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if we were sinners, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We were all lost. We were all separated from God because we were born into this world with a sinful nature, with the Adamic nature. Adam brought sin into this world, but the man, Jesus Christ, which they even call the second Adam, came and brought life to us. One man who caused the sin, the other man, the first begotten of the dead, took it all away. 1 John 4, 10 and 11 in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation means the atoning sacrifice. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. We have been extended such great mercy. Should we not also extend mercy to others? When they harm us, when they hurt our feelings, when they offend us, when they don't treat us the way that we want to be treated, shouldn't we extend mercy and forgiveness and love because God has done that to us through his love, Jesus Christ? You have your communion elements here today. Did everybody get one of these? Okay. If you just pull off the little cell, clear cellophane on the top, you can pull out the little cracker. Hallelujah. God loves you. And he sent his son for each and every one of us, no matter what we may be going through in our life. You could be like Paul. You could be one who've mocked Christians your whole life, but you feel the pull of the Holy Spirit on your heart. Maybe you were one who followed Christ closely, and then some really hard things came in your life and you walked away. You denied him for a time. He says, follow me, follow me again, follow me again. Maybe you were like David, you made some really bad mistakes and you've paid the consequences for your mistakes. You've set some things in motion that affected your life, but God still had mercy on you. You're still here. He still will forgive your sin. He will still save you. Maybe you were like this woman. I, I just think that maybe this woman was so broken on the inside from every failed relationship and here she was caught in, in sexual sin with somebody. Maybe that was you. Maybe that was me. And God came and washed it all away and made us new from the inside. I want to give everybody an opportunity in here to pray right now. I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. And we're gonna ask the Lord to just cleanse us of all of our sins and to invite him to come into our life. First, I wanna read 1 Corinthians, and then we're gonna to pray together and take communion. It says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. 
Now, verse 27, this is very important. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. I'm not here to judge you today, but we are to examine and to judge ourselves. So let each man eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. God brought the word of the Lord through Nathan the prophet to David. And he repented. And he was chastised by the Lord. There were some consequences. But God was merciful to him. Let's ask God to be merciful to us today. Would you pray this right after me? Dear Heavenly Father, I recognize that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I know that I have faults, I have shortcomings, and many failures. Lord, I ask you in the name of Jesus to forgive me of every sin that I have ever committed up to this very moment. I ask you, Lord, to wash me with the blood of Jesus. Make my heart white as snow before you. Lord, I invite you to take control of my life and to pour in your mercy and your grace that I might serve you more perfectly. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for this bread, which represents your body that was broken for us. And Lord, as we receive it today, we receive healing, spirit, soul, and body. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. Then you can just pull back the little foil paper. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord, that this cup represents your blood, the blood of the new covenant. We thank you, Lord, that we're not under the law, but that we're under grace. We thank you that our covenant today is based on mercy and grace. Just like David, if we will repent, O Lord, if we will have a humble and a contrite spirit, you will never deny us, but you will have mercy upon us and forgive us of our sins. Because of your blood that was given to us, Jesus, we can be made whole. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. <laughs> 